Well, hi, folks. Welcome to Conversations today. My guest is, I don't know how to describe him, really. He's one of these guys that's really well met. Every time you meet him, he's got a big, happy smile, a joke to tell you, and a or another story, an exaggerated one, I'd suggest. Not always are they um, true to fact, but nevertheless, he's he's a great guy to meet. Omnipresent is perhaps uh, an adjective I can use. He runs Vegas Promotions, who's responsible for bringing big acts and entertainers to town. The one and only Terry Lindblom. Thanks very Ter- much, Graham. And they're true stories. <laughs> they're not true Most stories. Of <laughs> <laughs> Most of them are. Most of them are. We have to start uh, with your early days. But I mean, Vegas Promotions, we should inform people who, who, who don't know. It's a booking agency. You bring big Ent- acts. Entertainment agent. Entertainment agent. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, you... Describe it better than I do, um, but you you come from a f- I think you come from a family of entertainers, or you're you're from a large family. Can we yeah. go back to the start? The, the Lindblom well, fl- family yeah. but is, yeah. is that German or no, Swedish no, no. or? I'm uh, this is why I'm so stupid. Uh, my father's father jumped ship in the 1800s. He was a, on a ship, obviously. Your Jumped-ship, grandfather, yeah, Swedish, mm-hmm. right? Jumped ship and ended up in a little town. He hid in a barrel. And ended up in this little mining town and married. There's two women in town and he married one of them. She was Irish. And my mother's side, both sides, mum and dad's parents come from County Cork in Ireland. So I'm three quarters Irish, one quarter Swede. And there's a saying in house in our house is what's dumber than a dumb Irishman? That's a smart Swede. <laughs> oh, no, that, no surely, we, surely not. We, you've got to laugh at yourself, <laughs> Graham. We laugh at ourselves all the time. I would have thought the Swedes were smart. Well, well, well that Swedish chef yeah. in the... Um, in the Muppets, he's not that smart, is he? Apparently, they're very um, uh, obliging people that uh, don't really see what's going on. That's what I've heard. I don't know. Okay, so you, your grandfather hiding in a barrel is intriguing. Do you mm. any more to that story? No, he, apparently, apparently, um, back in the day, he got a girl pregnant. And he was the most important person on the ship because he was a ship's carpenter. He was only 18 or 19. And. Uh, in those days, it was bad juju, so he decided to run away. So he got a job on this boat, jumped ship in some country town, some port in the South Australian, hid in a barrel. That's all I know about it, and ended up in some little mining town. Okay. Um, he was a very smart man. Um, and he came from a family of nine. We're all big families. Yeah. Um, so, what did, so what did your dad end, end up doing? Well... Dad was a shearer and a horse breaker. They, all my family came up from uh, Flinders Ranges. Um, Dad was born in Hawker. Mum was born in um, Oruru, I think, Oruru. And uh, he used to, in the season, he'd shear. In the off-season, him and his eight brothers, they'd catch Brumby's horses and train them and sell them. That sounds like a tough man, a tough, hard man. Yeah, but, a, yeah, but he, yeah, he was. Um, up there, he, he told me some great stories. They used to, there was eight brothers and they all played football, and Dad was the captain, all right? And he, you imagine this in these days, yeah. right? They'd run, walk seven miles to the game, and you'd get there two hours early, both teams, because there was no grass, and pick the three-corner jacks off the oval. That was your job before they started playing. And Dad and his brothers had a pair of boots they shared, so you'd play a quarter without boots, <laughs> and then you'd give your shoes to your brother, and he'd play a quarter with boots. These are different people, aren't they? I can re- but I can, I can re- remember those times. Mm. Not, not that I lived them, but mm. I... He, they they grew through the the depression years, so they. Oh, hell yeah. So what what country town was it? Hawker. Hawker. Yeah. So he played for Hawker. Up yeah. And <laughs> dad was his dad was a ganger on the railways. He was a boss of ganger, you know, building the railways. And um, mum came down to Adelaide just before the start of the depression, and dad followed her. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was pretty bad. Uh, dad said no one no one had work. Mum got a job as a cook for the Decrepnies, Doctor Decrepney in Adelaide Hills who was a good friend of um, Edmund Hillary. And Dad was his gar- Dad ended up being their gardener. Mum was a cook. And uh, Did he ever tell you stories about Edmund Hillary, Sir Edmund Hillary, no, the great polar no, no, explorer? But he met him. He knew him. Um, they thought the world of Dad. When I say polar, South Pole. Yeah, but my father was unlike his sons. He wasn't loud. He wasn't aggressive. He was a very, very, very nice man. And back in the old days... All the northern teams would get together and put a team together and come down and play South Australia. I think there was only four teams in South Australia in those days. And Dad was the captain. He was a good footballer. Well, they were all good sportsmen. Right? And uh, 
He went out at Torrens when he was 33, but he had three children or four children at the time. And he broke his collarbone. They really would have made it. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, and um, that was it. Good boxers, good runners, good good at everything. Uh, and he had nine children. You're one of nine. Yep. Whereabouts are you in the pecking order? I'm the second youngest. So you're the baby. Yeah. But let me just get back to my grandfather. He gave all the children as they were born nicknames. And I know these people to this day, and they're all dead now, but there was Uncle Dumpsy. He was a dumpy little baby. Dumps. And I always knew his Uncle Dumps. There was Uncle Manny. He was a real little man. Yeah. There was Uncle Oz. His name was Ozzy. Um, but they all had nicknames. And I used to say to Mum, because my father was the best looking. They were blonde. So what was your dad's nickname? That's what I kept asking Mum, and she would never tell me. Really? And you know, one night I got her, and she had a few drinks, and I kept at her and at her, and I said, come on. You know, she was in well into her 60s. I said, Mum, tell me, what was Dad's nickname? She said, don't you ever repeat it. I said, I won't repeat it. She said, don't you dare. Oh, I did years <laughs> later. She said he had two nicknames. His first one was Skinny because he was six foot and slim. But she said he hated his second nickname. I said, what was that? Beauty. Oh. His dad called him Beauty because he was a good looking The best boy. looking he one. looked a bit like Paul. You know, I've got a younger brother that looks like him, Jay. <laughs> and that's a true story. You know, Beauty. But down the pub one night when Dad was about... Well, he'd have been 72 or 3. We're having a few drinks after the football. And I said, Dad, and I was 20 stone in those days. I was into the waist and everything. I said, Dad, uh, can I talk to you about your your nickname, Beauty? <laughs> well, he didn't say anything, but he, he smiled. He looked up at me. He said, how oh, the bloody hell did you know that? I said, oh, I found out. <laughs> Beauty. So what, so what was it like? Were, you, were your big brothers protective of you or were they hard on you? No. Um, my oldest brother was a had an IQ of 170. He was a journalist on Fleet Street. Who was that? No, uh, he was a scientific and medical journalist. 170. No, oh, he's a very very intelligent man. He jumped from grade five to grade seven. And when the teacher used to leave the room, she used to get him out to take the class till she came back. He was that smart. He was a genius. Really? I'm, yeah, unbelievable. Is he still with us? No, he died about four years ago. Um, he actually put his cue in the rack. He. Uh, he, he was bleeding internally, and they said, look, we can fix this, Mr. Lindblom. And Noel used to always say to me, intelligent people die of boredom. And he said he'd had enough, and they said, well, we can fix it. But they said, if you start bleeding again, Mr. Lindblom, um, you're going to die. And he said, well, that's good enough. That'll do me. I've had enough. He was 81 or 82. Oh, gosh. Uh, no, he had enough. He had enough. Okay. I, I, I met Kevin. Kevin, Kevin, Kevin your, your older brother, who was a funny guy. He was a entertainer, often performed around the, the clubs. Tell us about Kevin. Well, what you don't know about Kevin was, um, as a sportsman, Kevin had the heart the size of a caraway seed. He was petrified. Right? <laughs> That's a horrible thing. No, but we're all truthful. If, if I, you shouldn't speak ill of the dead. I, no, I'd say that Kevin he was here. He'd laugh. <laughs> Kevin was the best sportsman in the family. He was the best tennis player. He was the best footballer. He was the best at everything. Never trained. He was one of those guys that knew where the ball was going to be. He could do a drop kick. He could do a drop kick. He could do anything, Kevin. He right. could play any instrument. He could play the band. He could play the drums, the guitar, the keyboards. In one of the bands, he used to go from instrument to instrument. Was he trained in that? Or Self-trained. Or? He had a couple of guitar lessons at... There was a guitar school here in Adelaide years ago. And he, he, he had a couple of lessons. Mum and Dad, could they play instruments? Could they Mum sing? Mum could play the, um, the piano and the squeeze box a bit. But again, they had to leave school early. Mm -hmm. And Dad played the... Um, squeeze box and the ukulele um, and you know those days I don't know if your parents did it they play cards till 10 o'clock they put a towel a, a, a blanket yeah. on the table and play cards mm -hmm. and then from 10 o'clock on everyone sang and um, they were great days they were great days mm -hmm. but, but Kev was a, a funny guy he was a comedian yeah. he did all the voiceovers on radio he could impersonate anyone. He did Ernie Sigley one night, and Ernie got a bit funny about it. You know that song Ernie used to sing? Think about me sometimes, let me know you care. <laughs> he did. Well, Ernie didn't like it, <laughs> but he did it. So he was the best Dean Martin you ever heard, Kevin. Yeah. He was brilliant. I loved him. Um, but as I said, if he had a bit of... He was just a natural at everything. But if you ask Kevin to change a light bulb or turn on a vacuum cleaner and mow the lawns, he'd get this blank look on his face like, what, what are you... What? So you're a kid, uh, youngest of the family. You're dyslexic. Second youngest. Second youngest. Yeah. Dyslexic. Yep. What was school like for you? Shocking. I had the worst schooling. I went to Catholic schools at first mm -hmm. with the nuns. I had no idea what they were talking about. They used to say that I was very intelligent. I wasn't trying. I could beat anybody at um, uh, general knowledge. But my daughter's got dyslexia as well. But 
it's it's fixable now. Yeah. In my yeah. day, they didn't know what they used to belt you, and that's why it leaves school in the end early. So, what was school like? Didn't what was the peer group like? For were, were they were you bullied? Or? That's why I ended up out of we're not. My brothers and my sisters were not aggressive people, but that's why I ended up being a bouncer because I was picked on. I was fat. I was dyslexic. I had everything going for me. <laughs> <laughs> Things were really good. Um, so I learnt at a very early age that I had to stand up for myself because I did get picked on. And uh, I was the fat kid at school you didn't pick on after a while because they knew. Who, well, who taught you to handle yourself? Me. And then Self-taught. as Self-taught. When I got older, then I started doing um, boxing and uh, judo, and uh, not judo, karate, which mm. was a waste of time. But Aikido was the one that I liked. That was the best. Mm. The, Joint. Yeah. yeah. Plus natural aggression that I learned through school. I'm not an aggressive, naturally aggressive person. They turned me into that. Terry Lindblom is my guest, folks. He's the director of Vegas Promotion, the entertainment booking agency. Uh, lots of stories to come. Back shortly. Welcome back, folks. Thank you for joining us on Conversations. My guest is Terry Lindblom. Yes, Terry Lindblom from Vegas Promotions. Entertainment agency. They bring all the big acts in. No, not, and some of the not so big ones. Mm. <laughs> 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 I heard you describing some of the uh, the stage parents and the stage mothers. We'll talk about that a bit later. But I'm intrigued how this kid who's got dyslexia and is picked on and bullied at school starts to make his way through life. You you obviously have to leave school, mm. or you feel as though you have to leave school because you weren't handling it. What did you do? Well, I must admit, the last teacher I had at school was an ex-boxer, and I learnt more from him, and I was coming good. I could have carried on. I don't know why. But he understood me, gave me time, and I was coming good, but it was too late. I'd made my mind up. Um, I became. I left school and uh, got a job as a truck driver as soon as I could, as soon as I get my license. Mm-hmm. And I lied about my age. I got my truck driver's license. And you, how could you lie about it? You could do it then. Because I was days, big. I well, back in those days, when you got your driver's license, you went down there and filled out a form. Don't you remember that? <laughs> I do remember that. And it they was... give it to you. <laughs> Here, away you go. All right. And... Um, I did that for a couple of years, and I actually enjoyed truck driving because you're your own boss and whatever. Um, and then I, uh, a friend of mine was a bouncer at um, St. Clair, and everyone used to say St. Clair Youth Centre. Youth Centre. Yeah. Tony Pilkin was the side, about the same, bit older than me. He was the compere, and he used to do the racing reports on Saturday afternoons on the yeah, radio. That's right. And we had everyone from Johnny Farnham to all the big names in those days. And I used to hold, Johnny Farnham's the same age as me, and I used to hold him on stage by the belt in front of 4,000 screaming girls while he sang Sadie the Cleaning Lady. Now, can you imagine doing that now? <laughs> and they'd be screaming. But we had them all down there. And um, I had more trouble with those kids than I did working in Hindley Street, you know, and they'd move in groups. And don't worry, they'd attack The kids me. at St. Clair. Yeah. Well, I was only a couple of years old, a year yeah. older than them. Mm-hmm. But they'd, they'd jump you. I got jumped a few times by in groups. Yeah, yeah. Um, Beaten what? Beaten up? Well, I've had a few hidings. Don't worry about that. <laughs> no one comes out unscathed. But I did it because um, you met lots of women, <laughs> and yeah. uh, and it was good fun. It was in those days you weren't scared of anything, were you? I was scared of the bouncer. I was right. always scared of the bouncers. They always had a mean presence about them. I thought. And... Well, I was a good talk. I used to talk to them first. I could fight, but if you know, I'd try and and that's why I got sought after. Um, as a as a bouncer, because I, you know, talked them for a while. Mm. But some people we just can't get to a point where there's not much talking going on. So there's a hierarchy in in, in the bouncing industries, and yeah, yeah. Or the, the the security industry, I suppose we should mm. call it correctly. Mm. How did you make your way up that? Oh, it's easy. I don't want to be just. <laughs> I don't want to be <laughs> go to be um, down on bouncers, but you know, none of them are going to build a rocket to go to the moon. I can give you a big tip, and uh, it wasn't hard to work out how how it should be done. And I always train my bouncers never to wear body shirts with bow ties and all that sort of stuff. Winnie taught me this. John Wynn. John Wynn. Um, mm. Just wear normal clothes. Do the London Bobby attitude. Get to know people. Mm. Up at Sam's Disco, where it was the biggest nightclub in town at North. We'd get we'd turn over fifteen hundred people through there a night, and I had eight bouncers working me upstairs and three outside. And if we had any big trouble, because all the footballers, Glenelg North, all the footballers come in, everyone. I was in the army in those years. I miss, I missed out on the Sam Disco. Oh, well, great day! They were great. I have I they still talk about it. Nord's well, the, well, well, Sam's Disco at Nord Footy Club. That was the place to be. And uh, if if there was a, a big big fight. Uh, not there was enough of us to handle it, but a lot of the guys that we knew because they knew us, 
they'd jump in and help us. Like it, it was the only place that people had dropped their children off and picked them up because they knew they were safe. It was a good, clean club. When you say you had a few hidings, how, how badly? Oh, yeah. I, I've still got a, a lump on the back of my head where I've got a... It's when you get more than one get you is the problem. You always get someone punching you from behind or whatever. Yeah. But I had a, a lot of big fights where there was a lot of people involved that were just a blur, you know, um, especially in Heine Street. Um, and do they do that? Do those frac, do those fights lead to criminal charges being laid? Not in most days. No, just you'd, have a, you'd have a punch up, be over and done with. People would shake hands. Usually, if there was a fight in our era, Grant, mm-hmm. if you and I had a fight and you had your mates and I had my mates there. My mates would keep my mates back and your mates would keep your mates back and it'd be me and you. Now, these days, 10 guys bash up one bloke and they're high-fiving each other and I don't understand it, how they work that out. You know? Were there any serious injuries? I mean, you, you hear about one punch and someone goes down, hits their head and uh, dies. Did you have any of those? No, there was a lot of it. No one got killed that I ever... When I worked in Heine Street, there was two people killed in the nightclub that I worked at uh, outside. One guy... We actually carried him outside because he he attacked us. Um, he hit me over the Remember those big platform shoes? Yeah. He hit me over the head with one of those. <laughs> I went down on one knee, hit me right in the jaw on the side of the head. I was helping him out. It was a big bloke from Salisbury, Gavin and Tats. Anyway, um, we had a bit of a punch on and uh, he lost and he was out cold. So we took him out and put him outside in the, there was an old shed there. We just thought he was sober up and go home. And apparently some people come along and buff heads and um, bashed him to death. Stole his watch and five dollars I think he had on him. So what sort of police investigation follows that? Never heard anything. They've never come and spoke to us. Didn't hear anything about it. Nothing. It sounds like you're almost culpable. I mean, you, you guy, you guy's unconscious. You carry him out. Well, what were you going to do with him? Um, Call an ambulance? He was only out cold. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't dead. He was still breathing. He was fine. We left him. He was all right and we left him. <laughs> Don't you understand how heartless that sounds? There was only two bouncers. There was myself and uh, Roger Joy and or Mike Ceruto, John Ceruto's brother. He was a heavyweight champion. We couldn't be outside the nightclub. We had to get him out. He, he didn't was, call the police. He didn't call an ambulance. Well, he just... well, his mates were arcing up. They wanted to have a go. We had to get him out and get back inside. It was, it was going to turn into a riot. Um, and no police, the guy dies and there's no police investigation? Nothing. Well, I, there probably was, but yeah. we, they never come and asked us about they it. They never did? Never. Nothing. We didn't kill him. Uh, Christ, if I killed someone, yeah. I'd be the first one to put my hand up. He was fine when we put him out there. Um, you haven't convinced me. Okay, then we killed him. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't not. tell anybody. Of course we didn't kill him. Um, but there was a no, couple of people. We're, we're, we're laughing about... A tragic case of somebody losing their life. Well, I'll stop laughing, but that's what happened. Um, we put him out. We sat him up. He was all right. He, okay. was, he wasn't out cold. He was half lucid. Okay. Right? Okay. And we said, when you're sober up, mate, go home. All right? And he, yeah, yeah. But some, some, there was witnesses that saw these boats come along and bash him. Oh, okay. Um, all right. You've, you've, you've convinced me now. Yeah. Okay. So it wasn't us. <laughs> so you're, in the, you're actually in the security business then, and, and you're yeah. running your own... Well, then I started... People like Winnie and people come after me and wanted me to be their head bouncer and run their, you know, because I moved up from that. They could realise I was reasonably sharp. Um, and then I started running the bouncers. The people running book bouncers off me, all right? Mm. Then I started managing Kevin, who was the best actor. Your talent. brother, your yeah, brother. Your Kevin brother. And, and it went from there. My young brother plays double bass and electric bass, and he's the best Jay Lindblom. He's the best backing singer in Adelaide. By, oh, really? By London. Oh, Jay's fantastic. Um, but but does, he, does he play in his own band? Plays in about four bands. I used to bring acts in from Sydney, um, singers, and we'd do big gigs. And um, I'd put Sit Jay in as the bass player with a guy called Alan Hewitt. Remember Alan Hewitt? Mm. He was one of the best musos going Well, around. in the Penny Rockets he was in, I think. Yeah. And he's passed away now too. Mm. But he was the Channel 7 Orchestra or whatever mm. it was. And the acts would say to Malford, who's the guy on bass that did the backing vocals? I say, that's my brother. They say, can I take him with me? <laughs> he makes me sound so much better. He was so good. He was a bit of a Michael McDonald type. You remember Michael McDonald from the Doobie Brothers? Oh, yeah. yeah well, he's yeah. the best backing singer in America. Well, he was. Yeah. Everyone used so him. So what, what does your young brother do? What is it now? He's a male nurse, but he still plays in bands. Um, Someone with so much talent can't make a profession of it? No. Nah. In Adelaide. Name me someone that's made it from Adelaide. Or could he have made it nationally or Kevin could have. I used to try and get Kevin to go to Sydney and book him, but 
You gotta, you gotta want it. And Kevin was quite happy to cruise around Adelaide and pick up his money. And he was earning good money in Adelaide. What sort of money was he getting for a gig? Let's go back to the, let's say, early eighties, late seventies, early eighties. Oh, you have to work the money out on scale. You know, probably five hundred dollars for a floor show. What's that equivalent to now? I know, Two, three grand. It was good money. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And Kevin wasn't good with money. <laughs> uh, he had money out of every pocket. He was. He had no idea with money, Kevin. But so, but your booking agency slowly grows from your brother to yeah. and expands. So, well, I started using his band, and Kevin's band wasn't available. So I was like, "Can we get another band?" So I got another band, and then it just went from there. Um, the band business is the hardest part of the business. Really, um, I'd much rather bring the footballers in, and they're the best people to deal with, better than the cricketers or all the other sportsmen. Really, Football, oh, footballers are down to earth, good, good people. Ninety-five percent of footballers are easy going, good guys. Um, the old cricketers are good. The young cricketers, um, well, they're on two or three million dollars a year now. They're a different... Uh, Why are they harder to deal with? Twelve of them or fourteen of them play for Australia a year. They're in the paper every day. They're, but they want more money or they have the, yeah, the, the self-inflated yeah, well, importance? Um, Shane Warne is 25000 a talk. 25000 25 grand. So he doesn't do them, it doesn't matter. He's worth millions. And if he goes over to Pakistan or India, uh, there's a lot of money over there, and they're the biggest cricket followers. They'll pay thousands for just to go have dinner with them. Amazing. Who's the most, locally, mm. who's the most sought after speaker, entertainer? There's a few of them. The most worked at the moment would be, uh, and he's a th- and you know him, Wayne Phillips. Wayne Phillips, Phillips yeah. <laughs> he's funny. He's a terrific bloke. <laughs> he is. Um, he's a superstar sportsman. Um, We'll just ask him that. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> well he got 160 in his first test. Thing, um, Did, is there any irony in the fact that he hasn't done one of these conversations yet? And you well, why hasn't he? That's a good question, actually. <laughs> no, you've got to get Wayne on. He'll have to be on the list. <laughs> Terry Lindblom yeah. is my guest, folks. Terry Lindblom from Vegas Promotions. Yeah. Back shortly. Thank you for joining us on Conversations, folks. Terry Lindblom from Vegas Promotions is my guest. And... And he's always great to speak to. He's always great to meet. He's got a story, a, a joke, a smile. I wonder about that. Is that is that a facade? I mean, is well, this happy, just happy demeanour that you portray. Is, um, is there a, a more? No, most of my family's pretty happy. I um, I do suffer from a bit of, uh, and it's very popular these days to have bipolar, and I've always suffered by a bit of depression. So. I think half the reason for that is that um, you try and make lighter situations by being happy, all right? But I have my moments. But generally I try and... I'm not religious anymore, but my little religion that I do, if there's because I don't believe in religion... When you, you say you're not religious anymore, were well, you, I was brought were, up were, Catholic. Were you once? Yes. No, my mum was a mad cat. And, and you know, yeah. I went to Catholic schools and whatever. Um, What's your routine? Every morning in the shower, all right, I leave the house, and I, make my, I say to myself, leave the house with good intent. And you can't do any more than that. Go out and try and be nice to people and be friendly. Well, how do you, what do you mean good intent? Well, well, go out with a good attitude towards people, you know. Um, be friendly to people. Be friendly to the guy that pumps your tyres up in the garage. Be friendly to the guy in the supermarket. Smile mm-hmm. at people. Cost you nothing. Dad taught us that. You don't have to pay anything for it. It's a free thing that you've got. Is it returned? A lot. If you smile to people and say hello to them, they'll smile and say back. Every now and then you get a... But most people, if you smile at them, they'll smile back at you. In this entertainment industry, and you say you became a bouncer because you saw these young girls screaming at Johnny Farnham, Mm. it's hard to develop personal relationships and serious relationships. You did. You've been married. Yeah, I, um, I was a bit of a boy. And I met my wife, she was 20, and she was runner-up in South Australia. His, Sharon Betty won it that year, and that mm. was Colin Betty, a yeah. mate of mine. Boxer. Yeah, yeah, heavyweight champion. And he said she would have won it only if she giggled too much. She was only 19 or 18 at the time. Your girlfriend? My wife. Well, you, sorry, your, my wife. your wife, sorry. Yeah. Met her, and I, I was going at lots of girls' girls and bouncing. And I fell in love with her in one night. And uh, I said to her that night, I was drunk, I said, I can't wait to see you again. She said, I can't wait to see you again. We got married within six months. Really? And I completely, and I often carry this around with me, I stuffed that up myself. Um, I had a good wife. She was beautiful. She was everything. And um, she loved me and I loved her. And I stuffed up and I have to carry that. How? I was running nightclubs, you know. 
Um, and how old were you? 27. You'd think I'd be a bit smarter, wouldn't you? Not really, no. I no, often no, wonder, no. Grant, no. they teach you at school all this algebra and all this other mm-hmm. stuff that you'll never use. The two most important things in your life that they don't teach you is how to financially get a house and teach you about finance. And they don't teach you anything about marriage. They're talking about having sex education, which mm-hmm. is fantastic. But they should teach people, and especially people of our era, because all the midday movies, everyone got married and they lived happily ever after and drove into the sunset or rode into the sunset, you know, Doris Day and whatever. We didn't know that part, you know. There's two words that they don't talk about. Devotion and fidelity. Mm. So important. And, and I, I think... A, a, a young man, particularly young men, although it applies to women as well, mm. you don't, you're not taught that. You don't learn that. You probably only learn it the hard way. Mm. Have you had kids? I've got two. I've got a, a 41-year-old son, Ben. He's got his own business in Melbourne. He's doing very well. And I've got my daughter who worked for 3AW for years in mm-hmm. sales. And she's got Limblom Media in Melbourne. And she's doing very well. Both my children are doing very well. My ex-wife and I are still good friends. Uh, she got married two years ago to a really, really nice bloke. Uh, I really like Gary. Um, so everyone's happy. So how did the how did the split come about? Well, it was my fault. You know, I was I was a bad husband. I was out late at night. And, you know, and how tolerant was she of that? Though? Very tolerant. And um, it was, you know, I regret it. You know, that uh, I lost a stone in a month and I didn't change any eating habits. I think it was tears. I really... really? But it was my fault. Yeah. I can't blame anybody. I... I um, you know, it'd be good to blame someone when you make a mistake, wouldn't it? But I no, no. It all, I, I think I think one of the mainstreams of redemption is to accept full responsibility, yep. which you've done, obviously. But I'm ready to settle down. Mm. Hey? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if there's any ninety-year-old women out there? That, no, I'm only joking. I'm only being serious. Uh, how so? How as 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 your personal life disintegrates? How mm. how does the business life progress? Well, Susan was in the business with me. Someone told her to stay in the business. That was another mistake too. Never work with your wife. It mm-hmm. doesn't work. You've got to have come home to each other. You know? mm-hmm. um, so I took on a partner, um, and I opened up, moved the office to Unley Park. I had a partner called Kevin Cramp. And he was with me for years. And I had, uh, I had 90% of the venues in town, everywhere from the casino to the hill, right everywhere, right? And after about, I was about 44, I thought I'll, I'll give it away. So I retired for a couple of years. And uh, you, you were wealthy enough to retire? No. I had, yeah, I know I had money, but... So you've had a marriage dissolution, you've had yeah. to pay I, it. Yeah, pay. I lost, yeah, that cost me a lot, but I, that was, you know, I re, that was... Four year, ten years before that, oh, I, okay. And um, I pulled the plug for a couple of years, and I it's a terrible feeling. Monday morning, you hear people going to work, you've got nowhere to go. But I was going to do some other things, so in the end, I went back to what I know best, which is entertainment. I got approached by Barry Brandon from Vegas Promotions because he was in business with Mario Mal, and they were just a little agency, we were the biggest. And uh, I joined him, he was just a small agency, and we built into the biggest, uh, by the way. Bruce died about four years ago. Mm-hmm. Leukemia. Um, that's how that came about. And then we started again. Somebody told me they had a boat at a marina and next to them was this massive boat that Cherry Lindblom owned. Is that true? No, I've never had a boat in my life. Oh, okay. Well, that, that, that's a, that's a furphy. Keep it going. <laughs> I'll take you out in it one day. <laughs> Sam always says to me, you know, he's got a terrific... <laughs> Sam huge, Newman. He's got a, t- a huge boat. And he used to say, I'll drive it around one day. I'll drive around Adelaide Terry. He said, we'll get out there onto the equator. And I said, <laughs> he said, but it, it was, it, the boat's that big, it would cost him $10,000 to bring it, drive it here and drive it back. So he never yeah. ever got around to doing it. But it, I've been out and it's a beautiful boat. There's always a, a period of, re, of uh, recovery and, re, and consolidation after a, a, a relationship breakup. Yeah. Have you found that? Uh, I've found it lots of times. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, you can be quite flippant. Well, my my because I was lost. I was I was actually you know I was still in love with my wife, so I just went on the rantan. And um, my ex secretary Joe Bogle said to me once, and she was an older woman. She said, "Terry, always your girlfriends, the ones that I actually go out with for a period of time." He said, "They're very." She said, "They're very nice girls. I've been out with very nice girls, and." 
some of them I should have married, I suppose, but mm -hmm. I never did because no, when we're I wasn't right. very good at it. I didn't want my kids to grow up and think, oh, you know, oh, my dad's been married twice or three. I didn't want that to happen. I didn't like that idea. You said you never married again. No, I had long relationships. Mm -hmm. mm. What, and, and now? Um, I was going out with a girl for 10 years. Um, we actually went over to Europe, her, myself and that woman, and Sam and Amanda, his girl, uh, for six weeks. And um, she always accused me of playing up, and I wasn't going. Um, and Sam always used to say to me, Terry, if they're accusing you of doing it, they're doing it. Well, he was dead right. I caught her red-handed. Oh, you yeah. met this girl. You know who I'm talking about. I'm not going to say her name. You've met her. Mm -hmm. uh, caught her red-handed at the house. And uh, I, she left the house, my house, that day. And I've never had anything to do with that ever since. And will never, ever have anything to do with that ever again. It sounds to me like you've been un unlucky in love, although you seem to have brought it upon yourself. Definitely. All, all the problems. I say to my kids that all the problems in your life will be brought upon you by your stupidity. Mm. and the rest you'll get from other people. All the problems you have in your life, a lot of them be caused by other people. So how old are you now? Do I have to tell people on radio? No, I, I have to, you have to. 42. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm 45. <laughs> <laughs> Terry Lindblom is my guest, folks. Uh, we'll, we'll, look, we'll get off the personal relationship side and we'll get on to some of the more entertaining aspects of his business, which is the entertainment business. Back shortly. Welcome back, folks. Terry Lindblom is my guest from Vegas Promotions. I guess the last segment we we got a bit heavy. We started talking about your personal life, and yeah. which and which you were quite honest. Let's talk about your business. Yeah. Uh, it's the business of entertainment. Yeah. You're mixing with amusing, engaging people. Some, some. Yeah. Tell us about some of them. Who's the Who's the best act you have brought in? I bring him in on a regular basis. I've been bringing him in Adelaide for thirty years, and he's my favourite. His name's Paul Martel. See, I read that, but I didn't. I can't place Paul Martel. Paul Martel, you would have seen him. He does impersonations of Jack Nicholson and uh, Cage. What's Cage's first name? The actor um, Ken Cunningham, Nicholas Cage. <laughs> Nicholas Cage. <laughs> Cage. <laughs> um, he is the best corporate. He doesn't swear. He is the best comedian in Australia. Has been for the last twenty twenty five years. Really, he's absolutely brilliant. And a he's married to Jane Scully. Okay. Uh, there must have been some embarrassments. Yeah. There must have been some yeah. flops. I'm not going to tell you this girl's yeah. name, but she was the queen of pop many times. And the story was that she would had been into the drugs and whatever, and she did a big show for me. Remember Mitsubishi's? They used to get mm. 12, 1,400 people down there. Yeah, yeah. And that was the biggest social club in Adelaide. So we went down there for the rehearsals. He arrived with her husband. And I, her husband was the ex. We know, who, I, I, we know who she is just by the description I, you've given her. I wouldn't say any names. Anyway. Um, he was the ex-boss of the drug squad in Melbourne or Sydney and he arrived there, did the rehearsal and could sing like a bird. She was fantastic. So he arrived back that night. Her MD drove over, musical director, yeah. and um, they went backstage and, you know, yeah, everything's going on all right. He trapped me in the hallway as she went up onto the stage and I was trying to get out and he said, oh, we must do more work and everything. I said, yeah, I was trying to get out the door to see. By the time I got out there, she started singing a song and halfway through it she stopped and went over and sat on the keyboard player's lap and started telling her how it was her mother's favourite song. Oh. He, this, the MD brought over some, I don't know, it must have been heroin or whatever. Then she disappeared into the crowd. The spotlight couldn't find her. She was sitting on someone's lap in the crowd. It was a disaster. She was there for about five minutes. It was one of the most embarrassing nights of my life. Really? Mm. <clears throat> did, the, did the client pay? They'd already paid. But oh. luckily they were friends of mine on the committee and they saw it when it wasn't my fault. No. So much for disasters. Tell, tell, us, about, tell us about the ones, that are, the reliable ones that Sam Newman always comes to town. Yeah. Sam, I'm, I've told you my age, Sam is the most generous, intelligent, brave man I've ever met. Really? Ever. He is, if, and you know him. Brave. He, how many people you know have an operation on their on their stomach, and then and I rang him and said, "Don't do it." He jumped off that um, the high board at the diving pool, oh, yeah. that? Mm -hmm. and he had stitches. He broke his stitches. He's jumped out of planes. He loves fear. We were coming into Melbourne once on a plane. I was going to stay a weekend with him, 
And as we were coming in, the plane was, they kept us out of that airport for an hour. And when we took off, because the weather was, it was dipping from the, it was oh, like yeah. the wings were touching that. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not a good flyer, all right? And Sam leapt forward and he looked at me and he looked out the window and he said, Terry, he said, I love this. Really? Yeah. He loves that. An adrenaline junkie. He's, he's jumped out of the, he's had the highest bungee jumps in the world he's jumped on. He loves it. Oh, the older I getting, the, 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 the more fearful I am of heights and exactly things right. like that. That's me, boy. <laughs> that's, that's brave. You've brought some villains in. Cho you used to hang around a lot with Chopper, Chopper oh, Reed. I managed him for about 12 years, and um, I know this is really hard to understand. He was one of my favourite blokes. He was a terrific guy. He can't, with that record, with I that know, police I record, know, know. he can't be a terrific guy. Well, to me, and and he was. I, I'm, I never had a problem with him. Uh, he was slight to autistic. autistic. Yeah, yeah. Um, he could quote Shakespeare. He was a freak. Really, he wasn't dumb, but no. he had this really bad upbringing. Um, if I woke him up at uh, eight o'clock, the more sort of go, he'd get up, make his bed. This is Chopper Reed, twenty three years in jail, made his bed. <laughs> Nothing was ever too much for him. He used to eat cheesecakes for lunch and just eat the worst food. His cholesterol was three and a half, three and a half. He'd never had a job and he'd never worried about anything. How did he live? He just lived. Well, he lived. What, stealing stuff from people? Well, he didn't steal. He, he, well, he did steal, but he only, he, as he always said to me, he said, I never robbed the square heads like you, Terry. He said, I only, he only stole off people, the drug dealers, uh, uh, the bad guys. And that's why it's amazing he, he lived so long because... He'd go into, he told me they'd go and, back in those days, the police would ring him and say, there's a card game here, you know, for whatever nationality. And he said he'd go in with his mate, Mad Charlie, and he said there was always a tough guy, and he said I'd shoot him in the leg. That'd stop that. And he said we'd take the money. And say, Let's shoot him in the leg? We'll always shoot him in the leg. He said that stops him dead, all right? Then they'd take all the money, 15, 10, 15, 20,000. This is yeah. 30 years ago. And he said, we couldn't go back and hit that place because the cops had come straight after us and say, look, you know, we know you did it. It won't happen again. You pay us a grand a week, a month, whatever. And we couldn't go back and rob that place again. And the police would tell him where the next one was a month later. And go and do he worked with the police for years. And he stayed at your place and you were good mates with him? Or did, did, he was not a problem. He was, but then he was in his 50s. He was, uh, he, he was married with his still, wife. Still and, tough in your 50s. Well, there's one story that, that worries me. He was very loyal, and that's what got him in more trouble than anything. One night it was me, Paul Martell, Dougie Hawkins, was a group of us, and we're out drinking on a Wednesday night. And the only place open those days was Joplin's at H Q. Yeah, HQ. HQ. And I said to him, oh, I don't like that place. You know, I don't like the last time I was out a bit of an altercation with a bouncer because they were like you, they were a bit nasty. Like so, me? When I like you said, they were a bit. They had an attitude. <laughs> had an attitude, right? You know, I got out of the four-wheel drive and he's gone to the boot and I thought he was getting his jacket and he's got the back of the thing up where you keep your bare tyre tire, yeah. and he's got a tyre on and he's putting up a the tire, sleeve of his A tyre lever. Yeah, he's putting up. I said, what are you doing? He said, show me these bounces. <laughs> I said, no, 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 Mark. No. He was just going to go up and clock her through in the crowd. You know? um, you, you, you brought Mark Jackson to town a lot. You don't talk to him these days, and you won't talk to him. What happened? I was the best man at his wedding. I'm the godfather to one of his children. I'm still a great mate of his wife. She was over here about three months ago. Great mates. In fact, I went to her wedding a year and two years ago. Um, he ripped me off. I always thought he had a good side and a bad side, but I think the good side was just an How did he rip you off? You, he, you, well, you, he, you pay him the money. No, when we were doing the chopper tours, he was handling the money, all right? Because he brought Chopper over. I showed him how to do it. Mm -hmm. He knocked Chopper off for about 40. Chopper said, I want to shoot him in there. I said, Chopper. He said, I just want to shoot him in the bum. I said, you can't do that these days. He said, I, he, he, knocked, he, he just knocked us all off. Um, really? And that was the end of it. And the way he treated Kevin, my brother. Oh, what happened there? Well, he, he, he said to Kevin one night, you're not funny. I'm funny. And just put Kevin oh, okay. down. Right okay. Just terrible stuff, you know. You've moved in exclusive circle. Uh, uh, look, uh, of course you've moved in e exclusive circle. Sam Newman's 70th birthday. Now, mm. that was an exclusive show. You, got, you were invited yep. to that. Yep. Uh, he, he said he got up a couple of times. He had only invited 50 people. He said, I could have had a million people here, but he said, you're the people I care about and you care about me. All the boys from the footy show with him, and Shane Warne plays golf with him and all those guys. And mm. 
I took my daughter. Now, my daughter's a glamour. She's a beautiful-looking girl, right? And she lives in Melbourne. And when I turned up, all the boys' eyes lit up. <laughs> and as I walked past their table, Billy Brown, she went out, he said, I hope that's your sister. I hope that's your daughter. I said, actually, it is. <laughs> but every time Shane came home, I stood in front of him and said, there you going, Shane? How are you, mate? <laughs> He he, won, he sorted over a couple uh, of times. Did he, of course. Not that she was interested, <laughs> um, but yeah, he came over a couple of times. But anyway, I'm sitting with his family, and Sam and I like the same music. And he was sitting down the back of the room. And at ten o'clock, the curtains pulled back. I didn't even know there was a stage there. And he had the man from Snowy River. What's his name? Tom Burlinson. Tom yeah. Burlinson with a ten-piece band, <laughs> and did all our favourites. All was you know, yeah, it was a great night. I thought you'd be an old rock and roller. No way. No, I'm a George Benson, I'm a okay. Sinatra, oh. I'm a Ella Fitzgerald. It's been a uh, a long, glorious, exciting... Like We didn't even talk about you going to the Oscars with Ann Wills, but no. uh, that's another story altogether. Yeah. Maybe I'll have to get you back to do that. Yeah. You're such a dominant presence in, in the entertainment world here in Adelaide. It's always great to meet you. It's great to have you on the program. Thanks for joining us. Thanks very much, Graham. Terry Lindblom has been my guest, folks, and thank you for joining us.